இவர்களை இந்திய சீன பதற்றத்துக்கு இடையே இந்த பிராந்தியத்தில் ஒரு பதற்றமான சூழல் நிலவுகிறது இந்த நிலையில் இந்தியாவின் அண்டை நாட்டின் இலங்கையின் வெளி விவகார செயலர் அட்மிரல் ஜெயநாத் கொலம்பகே நம்முடைய இந்த சிறப்பு அமர்வில் இணைந்திருக்கிறார் அவரை வரவேற்கலாம் அட்மிரல் கொலம்பகே தேங்க்யூ வெரி மச் ஃபார் டாக்கிங் டு தந்தி டிவி ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆல் ஹார்டி கங்க்ராச்சுலேஷன்ஸ் ஃபார் யோர் ரீசன்ட் அப்பாயின்ட்மெண்ட் எஸ் த ஃபாரின் செக்ரட்டரி ஆஃப் ஸ்ரீலங்கா Thank you very much. As we say, Ayubovan, Vanakkam, Namaskar, I am happy to be with you. That's very nice to hear. And also hearty congratulations for effectively containing the deadly COVID pandemic. Mr. Foreign Secretary, this COVID-19 pandemic has turned the world topsy-turvy. Even the mightiest nations are still reeling under coronavirus. What is the secret recipe behind Sri Lanka's success story? Well, if you look at Sri Lanka's success story, I think we are one of the most successful countries in combating the COVID-19. As of today, we have only, I mean, we have only 226 cases or the active cases in the country and our recovery rate is as high as 93%. And very fortunately, the death rate is as low as 0.3%. Uh, the main reason is we have given highest priority to saving lives uh, not the individual freedom but saving life was our main focus in fact last 150 days we are basically covid free in the community but still we have we are having a covid positive cases but it's mostly not mostly almost all imported cases uh, testing tracing and treatment were the three pillars of our success and also as early as february 1st we had the quarantine centers running we did not permit home quarantine i mean it was only after about july we started allowing home quarantine but until such time we said no home quarantine we have to do it in a dedicated designated place because home quarantine you see sometimes people get carried away and they may not be really ob- uh, obeying the health guideline so we were very strict on it we said only quarantine centers in a designated center and another reason actually is from the very early stages we started using the military the military came into the picture because they had the mobility they had the logistic they had the capabilities they had the trained manpower so they were effectively used in combating the covid-19 or the spread of covid-19 from day one and these are some of the successes that we have of course i have to say we receive a lot of support from countries like india china america and many other like south korea we receive a lot of medical equipment medical aid medicine test kit so all these contributed to the success story india sent two plane loads of essential medicine to sri lanka so the indian medical support the mm-hmm. sending very essential medicine at the most needed time was of critical important to maintain the general health because although covid is a virus unless you are you are having a healthy people then you become vulnerable you become exposed your immunity goes down so therefore indian support i must put it on record that was really helpful mr foreign secretary some countries hold china accountable for this covid pandemic is that approach right well i think stigmatizing this virus into a particular country is totally wrong this is a virus i don't know the whether the, the whether we will ever find out how it started where it started how it spread the fact that we know is that there is a virus which has really gone across the world so in that sense i think it is wrong to stigmatize it to a particular country particular nation particular community uh, or a particular region it is wrong to stigmatize a particular country and linking this country into a virus america is leading this charge against china do you think the motive is political well it could be i i don't want to talk about the united states and china in this mm-hmm. gathering today because it may be uh, they all have political issues there is a trade war going on there is a 5g war going on there are there is a war, war of words going on so therefore what we should do is we should not get entangled in that competition or that argument we should think about country first and in the beginning you mentioned of in your in the beginning of your interview you mentioned when the superpowers are 
finding it difficult to combat the virus. A small country like Sri Lanka was mm -hmm. doing it successfully. So now I think it is the time that we ask this question again, the same question that you asked, what is a superpower? Is it a power with mm -hmm. a mighty military, mighty economy, mighty diplomatic power? Or is it a country which can actually protect the lives of people? So that is the point. We should be focusing on protecting the lives of people. In Sri Lanka, we did not bother where it started. We did not bother how it was spreading across the world. We were concerned about Sri Lankans. You are certainly in a very enviable situation and hearty congratulations. <laughs> Best wishes for that. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about the road ahead for India-Sri Lanka relations, Mr. Foreign Secretary. There has been a Rajapaksa wave in the recent Sri Lankan elections. What is the implication mm -hmm. of the Rajpaksa rule on India-Sri Lanka relations? Well, to begin with, I don't think I like to use the word Rajapaksa wave. Rajapaksa is just a name, mm -hmm. but we are a democratic country. <laughs> and of course, this particular government led by a Rajapaksa got two thirds of majority. Now in a democratic country, I mean, of course, we have this preferential vote system, getting two thirds is nearly impossible. But still, the people voted for the government. So right now, because when you say Rajapaksa government, then there are other connotations coming into it. I mean, when you, uh, when you are in the academic field, you know, somebody would say Rajapaksa government is tilted towards a particular country. That's, but that, are, that is why I said, I mean, not to label it as a Rajapaksa government. This is the government of Sri Lanka, elected by the people of Sri what Lanka. What do you think is the implication manner. of this on India-Sri Lanka relations? No, okay. So there were like, you know, coming to 2015, there were this mistrust between India and Sri mm -hmm. Lanka. Coming to about 2009, the relations with Sri Lanka or the understanding between India and Sri Lanka was really good. But over a period of time, there were little suspicions uh, created in the minds of the leaders of India probably. And then, of course, there were some issues regarding bilaterally. But then... Uh, we, the, we believe that the 2015 regime change in Sri Lanka, this is something probably India wished to have, right? I'm not pointing a finger, but India probably wished because they perceived uh, the so-called Rajapaksas as uh, friendly to another country, which was not very friendly towards India. Now, what happened between 2015 and 19 Are you saying India is, preferred a regime change in Sri Lanka in 2015? Did India work for yes. it? Yes. Well, I don't know how you work, but India preferred a regime change in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the modalities. I don't, I'm not getting into a conspiracy theory. Uh, I have not seen this being rejected by the Indian uh, political leadership. Uh, yes, they wish for a regime change in 2015. Why do you think they did? Well, there are many uh, circumstantial factors. Uh, because we, uh, as per the Indian perception, we were getting too much towards uh, China, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, I mean, to be very frank. And uh, of course, two submarines came and docked in Sri Lanka. And submarines coming to a country, uh, to Sri Lanka, was not seen in a very good uh, manner right. by Indian strategic community. And that was on the and, eve of the uh, elections. Few well, that was on the eve of the election. Yeah, yeah, it was 2014. Uh, two Close submarines to the came. So, elections. Yeah. Yeah, so that didn't go really very well Do with you think Indian. Uh, the relationship has recovered from the strains of 2014-15. I, I feel it it has recovered greatly now. I think because mm -hmm. the chemistry between the two leaders are perfect, and chemistry between the two foreign ministers, two defense ministers, uh, two secretaries defense, two militaries are perfect, and I think this is the best uh, I have seen in bilateral relation between the two countries. There has been an interesting statement by you. India first approach in strategic and security matters. Your recent statement, Mr. Foreign Secretary, has triggered hope and expectations. Please enlighten our viewers on this policy. Well, you see, now this president has been very specific on this, mm -hmm. right? He has been very specific saying that we, we, when I say we, the Sri Lanka, should not be and will not be and cannot be a strategic security concern to India. Mm -hmm. That's period. We don't have to be. We cannot be and we should not be. Why we should be a, a strategic security a concern for India? We don't have to be. Have you, you been see, in the past? You at... Sorry? Have you been one in the past? Well, uh, I have seen, you know, foreign policies of governments 
uh, take different turns given the various periods. You know, sometimes, although we are technically, theoretically a non-aligned country, mm -hmm. but when you look at the foreign policy of Sri Lanka in the past, we have tilted uh, slightly away from non-aligned uh, foreign policy. We have tilted towards uh, one block or the other block or one country or the other block from time to time. So India may have seen that as, you know, a, secu a strategic security concern. The concern was that you are pro-China? Well, I say it's a concern because uh, I, I have not seen a strategic security threat by China in Sri Lanka against India. I mean, mm -hmm. you see now this Hambantota port is cited as a case where right. a Chinese military presence will be there. But I have not seen anything like that in Sri Lanka against Ch uh, India. Is this India first approach in tune with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's neighborhood first policy? Well, neighborhood first policy is something I really admire because to me, India neglected the neighborhood for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And Sri Lanka has done the same thing. We have neglected our own neighborhood for a long time and we were focusing on far away places, uh, neglecting your own backyard, own neighborhood. So India has a number of policies, I think, after Narendra Modi ji came to power. India first, uh, the neighborhood first policy, look, is policy. Yes, but I actually like more Mostly is the Sagar, because security and growth for all in the region, it's like the rising tide, we all rise. But how practically we can do it when you have this issue with Pakistan, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But Sagar has created a platform where we can really think of developing as the rising tide. Security and growth for all in the region, that's what we all need. Mr. Foreign Secretary, whenever Indo-Sri Lankan relations are being discussed, the China factor inevitably gets raised. The narrative that yours is still a pro-China regime is still very widely popular in foreign policy circles, particularly in Delhi. Is the much debated tilt towards China exaggerated? I think it's exa exaggerated. Now, this, let me answer in a different way. Now, I was coming to say this mm -hmm. president was really studying all this time you know, whatever happened between the two countries, what happened in the region, mm -hmm. and what about the investment. Right? So therefore, he has come out with certain policy guidelines. Number one, neutrality. Right? Number one is neutrality. We don't, and then he qualified by saying, we don't want to be siding with a particular major power. Right? And we want to stay away from this competition. So that's the policy number one. Then he says, we don't want to be a strategic security concern to India. Mm -hmm. Right? Then number three, he says, we want the Indian Ocean to be a free and low, I mean, I mean rules-based maritime, international rules-based maritime order for freedom of commerce across the Indian Ocean. We want that. And then also he said, we need economic development. We need to develop our people. So we are ready to uh, deal with any country who can bring in investment, who can bring in investors and also, he says, we want to maintain friendly relationship with all. So this all encompasses a new approach to our foreign policy. So in that, uh, categorically, only as a country, only India is mentioned. Why? Because he has repeatedly said that in when he visited India, when he took oath in, a, in the sacred city of Anuradhapura, and in, in his, all his speeches, that he is having India at a very high consideration level for security. So the but then, India first policy is a change of heart. It's a new approach. Am I to understand it this is, way? It, it, it is a new approach. It is actually based on the experiences in the past 10 to 15 years, right? Based on experiences of the uh, 10 to 15 years that you see, we have come to realize and the president is very clear in that we, Sri Lanka, should not be that aircraft carrier Mr. Shiva Shankar Menon mm -hmm. mentioned in his book Choices. That is right. Now, India has a huge population of 1.34 billion and Sri Lanka, for Sri Lanka, that should mean a big market. And your middle class is, I think, about 900 million people and that is a huge market. Mm -hmm. So we should really benefit from the development of India in the economic field. And this kind of a policy 
that uh, you know having uh, i didn't don't want to use the word india first anymore uh, of Why course <laughs> it, it it no it means the same thing you know when you say india first it may antagonize some other countries so i i'm not going to use that word uh, saying but i'm saying the same thing that we are having top priority of indian strategic security concerns in the heart of our president and the government i would like to draw your attention to another very important matter concerning this region months long border standoff between india and china has raised international concern how does sri lanka view this very concerning himalayan situation well it is a matter between two countries sri lanka is not a party mm -hmm. to that issue at all we are quite far away from uh, that border it is a issue between india and china so we believe that both these countries are very mature countries they are big powers in the world today and they have i mean third or fourth militaries in the world both are nuclear arm so it is not in the interest of anyone that this situation escalate into a war that this situation escalate into fighting so we consider that this is purely a bilateral matter between india and china and i am sure such great matured countries can find a solution through discussion and rather than allowing in to escalate into a war a war is not in the interest of your both countries or the region or the world for that matter we are mindful both are nuclear arm should there be a, 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 a nuclear weapons being used we all will suffer and that is the end of the whole region so we sincerely wish that this will not escalate to that level and you will be able to uh, sort out sitting across the table sitting across the glaciers and find an answer you have spoken about india first approach on security matters does this apply on the himalayan issue as well the indo china issue as well does india come first no i mean i, I mean i answer the question in an indirect way we have said that we will never be a threat to india's strategic security so in that sense we will not do anything har harmful to uh, strategic security concerns of india who do you think is the aggressor in this case in the himalayan crisis china or india <laughs> well i don't know the exact ground situation mm -hmm. what i know is the media reporting i get from indian side and the media reporting i get from the chinese side and some international media reporting so i don't want to make a judgment based on the media inputs i get without understanding the ground situation uh, without actually seeing what is happening there without understanding the nitty gritties of the uh, the positioning of the troops there who is doing what but is there so not a pattern think... to it mr foreign secretary many experts in fact international experts raise concern about china's aggression which start from himalayas to south china sea even extending till australia do you disagree with this assessment no i mean you see as far as sri lanka is concerned we want to really remain neutral in these kind of issues we don't want to because we are dealing a lot with china we are dolly dealing a lot with india we need both and actually what we really wish is that china and india collaborate in efforts of developing sri lanka here so we really don't want to point the finger at any particular nation uh, saying you are the bad guy or you are the good guy so that is beyond our our uh, thinking so you are not concluding that china is an aggressor here you are not taking a position on that no i am not taking a position on this talking about uh, another very important aspect of the indo sri lankan relations tamil nadu has been a very major factor in india sri lanka relations with its sentiments impacting impacting the bilateral relations very considerably what is your message to the leaders and the people of tamil nadu who are very concerned about the situation in sri lanka particularly for the minorities no i mean tamil nadu with like 60 million uh, tamil population they have very close ties to sri lanka and i have actually lived and worked and studied in tamil nadu for in a Madras very long University, time madras university sir i was in the tamil nadu wellington staff college i did the 50th staff college at uh, the beautiful nilgiris in the year 2000 in the year 94 95 for one whole year i lived there 
and I have been to like Chennai and many beautiful cities in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so I know a little bit about uh, Tamil Nadu. And I also know that there had been people to people connection or contacts between Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka for thousands of hundreds of years. So it's a great thing. So the message is that people in Tamil Nadu also should understand Sri Lanka better. It's not only the political, you know, one thing I have to say, maybe you disagree. Every time there is an election in Tamil Nadu, Sri Lankan issue become an issue, right? Every time there is an election. And after that, it dies a, a somewhat a natural death until uh, something comes. And then so you some accuse minor the concern is politically motivated. Mostly that is what I think. It is not the people to people uh, concerns. But what I'm saying is, and also if you see, it's not the major political parties who actually talk about this issue. It's the minor political parties who are uh, trying to gain power. This is my observation in a very broad sense. But what I want to understand, what I want to state is, the people-to-people -people contacts are important. People-to-people -people linkages are very important. Tamil Nadu should respect Sri Lanka as a sovereign country. And I have to tell you one thing. We are a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country. We have about 72% Sinhala population, nearly 9% uh, Hindus, and about 10% uh, Muslim. We have to live in this small country of 65,000 square meter, kilometers together. We cannot divide... But the concern in Tamil Nadu is even many years after the war, uh, there is a threat to the minorities of Sri Lanka, the Tamil-speaking minorities of Sri Lanka. There is no threat to minorities in Sri Lanka. Let me give you two quick examples. The COVID. COVID-19, there was zero discrimination. Every person who were either tested positive or infected with the coronavirus were treated equally across the board. No discrimination, none whatsoever. That right? is right. What and about all, the political rights of the minorities? No, I, 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 what, what, I mean, okay, let me come to that, right? In that, there were no discrimination in treating the people. And then, we, with the COVID, we had a situation, people did not have the income. Again, whatever the income, what, whatever the economic uh, incentives were across the board, no regard to ethnicity. This is one example. Then, the point that you're asking politically, please study the results of the 2020 uh, April 5th election. Mm -hmm. How did this government get a two-third majority in the parliament? Because Tamils voted for it, Sinhalis voted for it, and Muslims voted for it. In the North, right? this government, this political party fared very badly. No, in the, the in, the North, in the North, it's a different, different kettle of fish. No, yeah. but in that argument, even the mainstream uh, Tamil political parties fared badly. The TNA, the Tamil National Alliance, which is the mainstream Tamil political party, fared very badly in the North. Of course, they won the majority, but still, they came down from 16 to 10, I think. Right. What does that mean? But the performance means, of the ruling party is abysmal there? Extremely abysmal? Not really, not exactly. Not mm -hmm. exactly. You have to visit north and see the best roads are in the north. Mm -hmm. Best development projects are in the north. Right. So ask the people, not the political leadership, ask the people. There is a specific concern. The proposed 20th amendment seems to have caused some concern in the Tamil populace of Sri Lanka, in Tamil Nadu, even in New Delhi. Well, you see, Sri Lanka have uh, had many uh, amendments to the constitution. Now, 20th amendment is not sacrosanct. It is debatable. It is now, I, I just heard that the prime minister has appointed a high level committee to study the proposals and all the parties will be able to express their views on the 20th amendment. Uh, so 20th amendment will be, if it is going to I mean, get uh, implemented, it will be done in the 100% democratic way and that will really take into consideration the rights of minority in Sri Lanka. If, that, if the 20th, 20th Amendment will not harm anyone, it will be done for the betterment of all the people in the country. Mr. Foreign Secretary, the specific concern is this could possibly end the provisions of the 13th Amendment, a consequence of the Rajiv Jayavardhana Accord. 
Now, 13th Amendment, you know under what circumstances under which it was implemented in, the nine, in 1987. Right? So, if we try to go back to 13th Amendment and talk about the circumstances, you get a very different perception among but the Tamils. But the current leadership you... has spoken about 13th Amendment and 13th Amendment Plus. Does your government still no. stand by that promise? Well, I don't know the, the stand of the government. That is up to the parliament. I'm not a member of the parliament. I'm only a, a government official. 13th Amendment, many things have been implemented. And now I think it's high time to see whether we have really derived the best results from the 13th Amendment or whether anything need to be changed for the betterment of the people. If we can do that, thinking of the people, how people are going to be benefited from any amendment we take, any new constitution we want to have, I think the people-centric constitutional amendment is the best for the country. Now, 13th Amendment, many things, the provincial councils are there, power is vested up to a certain level, uh, that mechanism is functioning. And Do you rule out a threat to the provincial councils in the 13th Amendment or not, talking about the 20th Amendment? No, I don't know exactly what will happen. That's what I said. I'm not a constitutional expert. I'm not even a member of the parliament. So and I am only the foreign secretary. So I have not really got into real contact with the constitutional amendment uh, process. Uh, but I have a feeling or I my, my observation is that it will be done thinking of the people, the betterment of the people at heart in a very democratic way, listening to all sides. Has Delhi conveyed their concerns to you on 20th Amendment matter? Has Delhi conveyed its, its concerns? No, I, I don't really know. I don't really know because I have not seen anything officially uh, concern expressed by Delhi. Right. We have come to the end of this interview, Admiral. What would you like to tell our viewers, the people of India, people of Tamil Nadu in particular? I think the people of India and people of in, uh, Tamil Nadu are our brothers and sisters. We have a great cultural heritage link. The most important thing between our two countries is people to people link. We have many things in common. We need to shed away the unnecessary baggage that we have been carrying because we dwell on the past too much. That's all gone. So we have to look at the future and we have to work as two independent nations mutually respecting each other's aspirations, mutually respecting each other's concerns, mutually addressing each other's strategic consideration, and also understanding the development needs of the people. Thank you very much, Mr. Foreign Secretary. Very kind of you. Thank you.